Welcome back to the shop, gentlemen. In the previous episode, we had some dorkly fun taking shit apart. Mainly on the mechanical side, but also on the motor, rotor, and windings. In this episode, we are going to confirm that it is molydisulfide. We are going to revisit that crown gear, because it is an interesting case study. And we're going to have a few laughs at the dunderheaded mistakes that I made in the previous episode. Ain't nothing to it but to do it, pitter patter, let's get at her. At the old Hicko 888D at 301 degrees, we're gonna see if it melts the plastic. And no, it does not melt the plastic. So we're going to 350, which is what that horrible teal color plastic melted at. That's hot enough to melt the solder. Doesn't even touch it. And again, that's in real degrees, not American pesos. Okay, we're at 400 now. Let's see if that mounts it. And there we go, melting the plastic. Okay, but that's a far sight better than the Makita because uh, the Makita actually started melting at 300 it would start to touch it and then 350 it was doing exactly this which uh, the DeWalt is only doing at 400. So I told you I was going to do some research and research I did which in those teal color tools uh, there's a site called Bionor that does uh, plastic injection molding in the Europe that has supplied some but there's no data on the plastics they used however on the BASF website which is famous for dyes and making plastics for the past thousand years. There is lots of data, and this uh, DeWalt is actually BASF uh, Ultimate B3ZG6, which is glass fiber reinforced impact resistant. It is a PEI polyether, uh, anyway, I lost it. It's a polyethyl something, 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 fiber glass reinforced. And the brush holders are also that BASF Ultimate, but a different uh, A3EG6. They have a listed melt temperature of 260 degrees C. Of course, with uh, our crappy little test setup here, the soldering iron, we're going to get different results, of course. But just comparatively, we could tell that the Makita melted at a lower temperature than the DeWalt. And that makes sense because the Makita is from uh, Bionor and they don't have any specs on the plastic and BASF, I mean, is the plastic manufacturer par excellence for the past two millennia. So we're gonna go ahead and test this brush holder. And so at 400, it's just starting to, to touch it. So we're at 550 now. Let's have a peek here. Still pretty good. Still pretty good. Okay, now we're into the most problematic part of any power tool, which is the trigger switch. It always uh, craps out. No surprise, because uh, a lot of problems, of course, between the driver's seat and the steering wheel. This is a steering wheel in this case. It takes a fair bit of abuse. Now this is nice, it's got its own fastener. Normally, a lot of times you'll just sandwich the case and it'll be on pins and it'll sandwich itself in there. But this, uh, yeah, it's got its own fastener. That's a nice feature. And here's something you will not see on an industrial site, which is a trigger lock. Uh, the reason for that is they don't want you going for a ride uh, if, the, if the thing takes off and catches uh, or you set it down mistakenly. Uh, it's going to fuck right off on you and if you're on the other end of it, uh, it's in you're, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So they get rid of that uh, trigger lock. I love the trigger lock myself. Uh, that way you don't got to hold the handle like a sucker. But you know, safety first, convenience last. The poor bastard on the end of this thing's got to hold the trigger all day. Nothing a piece of tape can't solve. So that looks like thighs high heat kind of paper like for insulating transformer windings. I think they call that fish scale, fish scale paper. Nice positive snap action switch. Beefy snap action. And this is a quality switch, a Markart 1269. This retails from the wholesaler, uh, electrical wholesaler, for 40 bucks. So you can imagine what you're going to pay if you got to buy one of those from DeWalt. Probably about 40 bucks. 
And uh, this is pretty telling though, if you check it out, electrical rating is 22 amps at 125 volts, one and a half horsepower. So on the box it says two and a half horsepower, the switch is only capable of one and a half horsepower rated. So clearly somebody's pulling some wool over some eyeballs somewhere. And this has got silver contacts, so let's have a look at that. A very rugged ka chunk ka chunk switch. Have a look at the bus bars that the contacts are soldered to. They are about three times thicker than you'll ever see on a cheap Chinese switch. And then if you look at the terminals, they are solid brass with big, huge contacts. And normally you would see like a little bendy, you'd see a little bendy bracket in the this would go through, you know, and you'd be going through maybe a, a maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of material. But here you can see there's almost a quarter inch there of thread. Very nice. I'm just putting this together, and this is interesting. These are solid wire, not stranded, so they're more quite a bit more prone to uh, work hardening and breaking. I'm frankly quite surprised that they would go with solid wire for these leads, but uh, they have. I uh, just measured the gear ratio, it's right around two and three quarter to one, so that means that this electric motor, this universal motor, is spinning at 27,000 ripples. Okay, got this all back together. I even put the guard back on. Aren't I a good boy, Mum? What we're gonna do is put the clam on, clam on ammeter on, and check the inrush current, and as well check the windage current, just uh, how much current is drawing in idle here when it's just uh, pushing air and brushes and all that good stuff. And then we'll go ahead and, and torque stall it and I'll get the predator vision out and we'll see what's building up heat and all that fun stuff. Oh yeah, and when you're putting the wheels on, never, ever use the spanner to tighten the nut. Just put it on, lock it, and hand snug. There's no better way to piss off a fabricator than to crank that on with a six foot snipe. You're likely to get a fist in the chiclets if you do that. Okay, here's the setup. In the far right corner is the variac. I'm fancy that way. That way we can bring the voltage up slowly for the torque stall. There's the clam on ammeter and the voltmeter just for shits and giggles. In the foreground here is the DeWilt 12 amp. You guys smell the smoke? I hope I'm ha not having a stroke. Stephen Harper. Thursday, one eight four three six five seven two. Yeah, no, I'm okay. Oh, I'm right by the vice. That's where I burned that plastic. Yeah, yeah. And I'm already. I didn't even plug anything in yet, and I'm frying stuff. Okay, Variax live, and we're bringing up the voltage slowly but surely. Don't call me Shirley. We're gonna stop at one hundred and twenty volts. Good enough. And we got this set to uh, something, something. What am I missing? Oh yeah, 60 hertz. Good to go. <laughs> I sing. I, I one-handed that one. It just about twisted out of my hand. <laughs> yeah, 37 amps inrush current. She's a torquey little rig. So now we're going to run her just for the windage. This is in idle, not doing any work.
That is one loud mofo. I wonder if they do the no grease thing so it sounds louder. It sounds more powerful. As if it's loud, holy. So we can see the uh, the brush assembly. It's pretty cool as a cucumber there, five degrees. I don't know, it's, it's not very hot in the shop, obviously, I've got my winter coat on. And there's, uh, the interesting thing is there's a lot of heat built up in the gearbox already. That's not even working. No, oh, for fuck's sakes. Stupid thing times out all the time. Enough to drive you around the bend. Man, my ears are ringing. That thing, uh, yeah, that's getting hot in a hurry. But fuck, if this keeps up, I'm going to have to get myself some ear hole pluggers. Ears are ringing. So now I'm going to torque stall it, and what that entails is putting the lock pin in and locking it, and then I'll slowly increase the voltage until uh, we see the smoke, I guess. Okay, so we're going to torque stall this. Hear it humming away there. 30 volts, we're at almost 6 amps. Now that, uh, those brushes should be fairly warm. Because of course we got no cooling, because the fan's not turning. I'll take a shot of that. And actually the motor shaft is what's the hottest there. Commutator bars are fine. There's that, uh, it's deceptive because it's self auto ranging here. It looks red hot, but it's not. It's only 30 degrees C. And yes, I will say that. Oh, you fucker. This thing, I don't know, man. It's fun, it's good, but it's got some features that are a real pain in the ass. Oh, let's get her cranked up here again. Yeah, so I would say that thing is uh, definitely torquey enough to trip your breaker if it's ever stalled out, but it is a grinder, not a saw, so chances are you'll never really stall it out. Got plenty of torque. Let's have a quick peek here at the brushes. No cooling. Still not too bad. Warm, but not smoking. Not, not even close to smoking. Ah. That did pretty much nothing. Well, okay, we're going to button this up. I'll put the handle on and the guard on. I'll get some gloves and some ear hole pluggers. We'll see what the amperage is when I'm feeding our hot supper. I've had the heater going all day, and it's important to note that it is a balmy 12 degrees C in the shop. Downright tropical. Trip the breaker. That's a 20 amp breaker. So there's the workpiece. Got nice and hot. And uh, there's the saw, rather grinder. Handles nice and cool. Brushes. A little warm, no big deal. Field windings, 30 degrees. R2D2 top hat. Look at that. Cool as a cucumber. So I couldn't get the brushes to really warm up, so I really, really leaned on it. I had it up to 30 amps until the 20 amp breaker in the shop here blew. Well, there's no doubt that this thing is a beast. Check out how much metal it moved in 30 seconds. Incredible. This DeWilt is a Makita killer, there's no doubt about it, and I see now why the fabricators uh, like this so much. It's a good heavy duty grinder, we'll see how well those brush holders stand up, but as funny as it sounds, you know, it is good plastic. Now, if only it were red and said Milwaukee on it. And I was looking specifically for the failure mode on these for guys who are pros and use them, and, uh, and commenter Jeremy Knuth says that uh, it's not the motor that packs it in or the brushes 
or those chintzy little brass brush holders, it's the gear set that packs it in. And having tested this, that's right in line with our findings here. Uh, like I said, it's got really good airflow. It doesn't really heat up. Now, I'm sure if you're down in Guadalajara working on an enclosed meth lab, this thing's going to heat up pretty good. But it, I don't think it's the windings or anything that's going to fail. I have a feeling it's going to be this gear set here. And i got to tip my hat to fellow YouTuber Kizmox in Finland, who tipped me off to the fact that that bevel gear might be, wait for it, a metallic powder gear and speaking of finland you ever get the chance to go to finland you gotta go they're fucking nuts but be forewarned as a simple country bumpkin myself from the backwoods of canada it is a huge culture shock you're gonna be eating berries and jam every meal pickled herring on the stick with a side of jam and before they get you hammered on homemade aquavita which consequently tastes like aqua velva. They're gonna make you strip down to your skiv, well past your skivvies, into your birthday suit. You're gonna go into a hot box with a bouquet of birchwood switches that you're gonna whack yourself with. So anyway, you're sitting in here with the guys, you know, whatever, dink hanging out, yay. And then in walks mama, dude's wife, naked as a jaybird. In walks the son, in walks his smoking hot 16 year old daughter. You want to talk about uncomfortable. If at all possible, you're going to want to get drunk on the Aqua Vita before you go into the sauna. And the worst part about it is you're the freak because you didn't grow up running around with your tallywhacker out. And you're trying to oh so suavely angle your legs so the 16 year old daughter doesn't get the full Monty of your 30 year old twig and dingleberries. Let me tell you, after a few minutes of that, jumping into a frozen alpine lake is a pretty good option. Yeah, anyway, Finland, good times, good times. So we've run it, the thing is a beast. Now comes the time to revisit these marketing bullshit specs. So what I did in the previous video to give us power, just as a quick check, is power is equal to amps times volts. Of course, that doesn't work because it's AC. So this gives us what they call VA, and that's actually how they rate transformers because nobody knows in a transformer what the power factor is going to be. Now the problem with motors is the power factor varies depending on the loading. So we need more data from the manufacturer in order to make an informed decision. And the reason we need this little fudge factor here, the power factor, is because the voltage is sinusoidal and the current lags the voltage. So depending on whatever load conditions, this power factor could be 0 0.95, it could be 0 0.5. That's a huge variance in the actual power. So if we just use VA, we can use apparent power or just as a quick and dirty kind of comparison, but it doesn't really work. So what we actually need from the manufacturer is a graph of the motor. And this is just input. This is not what is happening at the spindle. This is not speed or torque at the spindle. This is just input to the motor. So if we have here RPM and we have here torque, in a universal motor on AC, the torque curve is going to look something like this. So up here we'll have 27k and down here we'll say 60 ounce inches. So when we're actually turning the spindle speed at 10k, 27k on the rotor, motor rotor, there's very little torque being developed. All it's doing is just, uh, it's, it's a big fan. And then as we load it up, the RPM has to drop in order to develop more torque because we need slip in order to develop that torque. So if we add another piece of data here, which is amps, you're going to see that as we come down and develop torque, the amps come up. So at 60, at 60 ounce inches, we might be at 30 amps. Then we add another measure in here which is going to be your power and what the manufacturer is doing is 
they are cherry picking numbers. So the marketing engineer says, well, we want the most power we can possibly get to put it on the box. So we're going to go 1800 watts. And then instead of actually just coming down the graph and taking all these numbers in line, what, what should happen is they're cherry picking. They're, they're saying, okay, it, it runs at uh, 10 K spindle speed. That's 27. So we'll take that number. That number looks good. And then, uh, we don't want this up at 30 amps because nobody will buy it. It'll trip the breaker. Let's put this down here at uh, 12 amps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 12 amps. That ought to do it. So really what's on the box is complete bullshit. What we actually need is real data about the motor in order to make an informed decision. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So we have to re-deconstructionalize this because we've had some interesting comments. One from uh, Nevin Williams, longtime viewer, suggesting a good way to test to see if that is molydisulfide. And uh, we're going to do that. And also, critically, is to find out how this gear was manufactured. Because as I said, uh, Kismox in Finland suggested that this was a powdered metal gear. I thought he was crazy. Come to find out, he's crazy like a fox. So that would totally explain, because this has to be in a mold, that would totally explain why these are all rounded right over nicely. Nice draft angles and all that sort of stuff. And this sort of goldy kind of coating on there might be a secondary process that causes the surface, surface of this to be impregnated with silver. Rather, copper. I don't know why I said silver. So we're going to, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and harvest some of this moly disulfide. Or rather, at this point, the uh, gray goop. We're not quite sure what it is, are we? There's been a few comments that uh, people think this is graphite. Now, to me, it's not dark enough for graphite. If I recall correctly, the particles, the individual particles were gray, not uh, jet black, but really, who knows until you try, right? So what I'm doing is I'm just liquefying the grease fraction here, and then we will let the solid particles fall out into the bottom, and we'll pour off the liquid. We should be left with a reasonable concentration of uh, the good stuff. At this point, uh, might as well be pixie dust for all we know about it. So here's our second washing, and it's quite a bit clearer. We can see we're just about got all the grease out. That should be good enough for our purposes. And I really prefer not to have a Richard Pryor situation on my hands, so we're going to let that flash off before we heat it up. And in the meantime, I'm going to brew up a tincture to get the copper off this. Don't tell my wife I stole the vinegar. We're just gonna have a little vinegar party here. So this is the acid we're gonna use to dissolve the copper. And uh, about that much. And we're gonna add some hydrogen peroxide to taste. That'll make a chooch more better. And that's about right. Okay, so we'll pour a little bit of this onto the gear. And now in the control, we put a little piece of copper. And we wait. Now, while we're waiting, I'm going to fire up. This is flashed off nicely. We're not going to Richard Pryor ourselves. I'm going to flash up. We've got the beaker full of pixie juiced and broken dreams on the apparatus. And we are going to apply the heat. Now, do not do this with regular glass because it will shatter. This is borosilicate glass labware. And Pyrex used to be good for non-shattering, but new stuff is garbage. It's not borosilicate glass anymore. It's uh, some crap. Okay, so I clearly got it hot enough because it is evolving a horrific brimstone smell like the bowels of hell. So there's clearly some sort of 
edema causing sulfur compound in there that's going to turn into sulfuric acid in the mucus in my lungs. So that's great. This is a myth confirmed. This is molydisulfide and not graphite. Well, it's been about five minutes. I've been dicking around with this molydisulfide trying to get a stink out of her. And we can see that the solution is doing its magic. Some of the copper is going into solution. You can see there's a blue aura. So hopefully if we leave this on here long enough that uh, solution will turn slightly bluish. We'll know that it's got copper in it and we can assume beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a powdered metal gear. Okay well I did a little more research on this because I was curious as to how the uh, lubricating properties of this actually work. Molybdenum disulfide actually is a naturally occurring mineral and it occurs in massive sulfides, uh, porphyries, of course because it's a sulfide mineral. And what happens is you have the molybdenum atom in the middle, then you have layers of sulfur atoms bound to the molybdenum atom. And what happens is when you have layers of these little platelets, they like to slide on each other because the, uh, the sulfur atoms are super happy where they're at. They don't want to bind with anybody. And that is the same thing that happens with uh, graphene and, and graphite lubricant. They slide in nice platelets. So this is the same lubricating action as that. But I found out that the dissociation temperature is like 1100 degrees, which if you're a blacksmith, you know that that's almost white hot. And uh, I didn't even get close to white hot. So what I must have been smelling was the last of the oil burning off. Now, because this occurs naturally as a mineral, we can go on the geology side and check its luster, its streak, its Moore's hardness to determine if indeed it is molybdenum disulfide. And also, according to the reference material, this mineral has perfect cleavage. I'm going to put, put a sample on a tile, and we're going to do the streak test. Okay, streak test. Now look at that. Metallic luster. Blue-gray streak. And uh, just from the feel, is greasy as hell. Myth confirmed for the second time. For real this time. Molybdenum disulfide. Not graphite. Oh, our control beaker has clearly got a blue tint to it. We know that there's copper ions in there. Uh, no surprise. Uh, my shiny copper in there too. Copper wire. This, however, has no blue tint and it's starting to turn shit brown, meaning it's rusting the gear. So we're going to have to have another go around at this uh, in a different way, see if we can figure it out. And uh, I've pretty much tried nothing and I'm all out of ideas, so I think it's time for a cup of tea, a little set, forget about this and it'll come to us. I enjoyed some tea and sympathy with my dear, sweet, long-suffering wife and she was quick to point out my dunderheaded mistake in that the acid is preferentially going to attack any iron that's exposed. And I show this uh, effect clearly in a previous video where I make a penny float. Well, this is a classic case of keep it simple, stupid. I put this MG Hallmark and powder gear into the gargler and out popped MG mini gears in Padova, Italy with a, and not that this gear is made in Padova, Italy because of course they have a factory in Yulong Ding Dong, China. So this is a powdered metal gear. And that explains the surface roughness. That explains these, all these rounded over bits. It also explains why the failure mode is this. The pinion, of course, it looks machine. I would bet dollars to donuts that it is the pinion's uh, standard hob. But this is pressed powder and then sintered all together. Now, gentlemen, I appreciate your comments your concerns and especially your technical know-how if you care to chime in on any of this. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up here telling you that the failure mode is going to be the trigger switch here. That always fails in every tool. And then it's going to be this gear set. It's not going to have to take too many 200 pound gorillas on a, on a wild ride there. You get a big, thick, heavy grinding wheel and a 200 pound gorilla on here and she binds up. Uh, it's not going to take much to shatter these powdered metal gears and turn them back into a, a nice shiny never sees looking paste. Uh, yeah, thumbs down for the powdered metal gear, no effing good at all. 
Mind you, they do have this in the XRP drill. That gear set is also powdered metal. Now, whether or not that stands up, we're gonna have to wait for another episode for that. Now, gentlemen, I appreciate your comments and your technical expertise, especially. Uh, I don't mind revisiting this if, if something new comes to the fore. And I really appreciate your comments, especially, you know, you caught me on a few things. I had no idea that was, I uh, learned something. So that was awesome. And I gotta say, what nobody caught me on was I made a mistake right off the bat on my dead reckoning because I had assumed that that 3,000 pounds on the pinion was weight pressing down, but it's actually clamped like a disc. So it had to be twice the actual number that I gave you. But anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Keep your stick on the ice. And there's a lovely blue Star Trek drink now full of free copper ions just waiting to unleash its antibacterial properties for weirdos that uh, drink silver and copper and all that sort of stuff. So I got the new grease in there and just for shits and giggles I got it on the triac. So we're gonna see uh, where it actually starts. So here's what it looks like with the better grease. About a thousand percent better. There's actually some grease on the gear teeth still and you can see uh, it's flinging off the, the center there. And interestingly enough, see this uh, Triforce here? That's clearly for getting the sintered metal or the powdered metal gear and pressing it on in a jig. So there'd be some index pins that go on there and push it in.